I think the 80s and 90s films were golden eras of film. These movies just jumped off the screen in, in an epic way. People wanted bigger and better. Road Warrior was everything within camera. Arnie and uh, Sly came in, perfect timing. And suddenly we had those movies where the action was dominant. And that's what they wanted. After the Rambo, there was an explosion. That's all they wanted. Rambo was actually a Saturday morning cartoon. When I see it now, just the, the technical, the, the practical effects, unbelievable how those stand up. I do think that Die Hard, still to my mind, is one of the top five, if not the best, um, action films ever made. I was very lucky as a composer to come at a time where things were really exciting. It felt like the lowest low-budget film I've ever made. Fuck you. Huh? Don't be modest. Arnold put his stamp on the movie so much, I've never seen that. I'll be back. I'll be back? That's cool. You saw Schwarzenegger for the first time ever express fear. Everybody was, you know, renting John Woo movies. The beauty about action is that you don't need translation. Watch this guy. That's what I want to do with my life. I want to do what he does. In 35 millimeter, on a big screen, slow motion. Yeah, that's Van Damme. He's really doing that. It was how you looked. They used to call it buff. You look buff. And by 1988, they were making movies for the video show. I think once they realized how tough I was and I could fight just as strong as the men, I gained a lot of respect that me. That's what people want to live vicariously through. And they had that. It's full-on Pulsner punches. Gory, violent. Miss those movies now. If you look at a list of uh, film genres, uh, in any kind of book or publication about Hollywood, you won't see action movies listed as a genre until really the 80s. I grew up watching westerns. Red Ryder, <laughs> Lash LaRue, Roy Rogers, Dean Autry, Johnny Mac Brown. That was the when I really started to go to the theaters. That was after the war. I went to the, to the theater basically three times a week. I was addicted to uh, American uh, action uh, films. The chases, the horse chases, the action, the gun shooting. A lot of movies from the 60s that I, uh, I grew up watching in movie theaters. The Great Escape, Professionals, fantastic movie. I suppose I begin, like many sort of people of my era, with Bond. As a small boy, the idea of a Bond movie coming on television was extraordinarily important in my life. My father said, oh, we're going to see this new action movie. And then we watched the film and said, this is like the greatest film ever. James Bond, 007, licensed to kill whom he pleases, when he pleases. It was released as a kind of generic action picture, but it caught on quickly. We also watched, there was also a lot of uh, urban detective movies, private eye movies. So they included sometimes also some bits of action movies. I preferred 70s action films, French Connection, Bullet. There's a very strong director focus about the character, what they should be doing, and the believability of it. Yeah, Steve McQueen's golden years. Steve McQueen was a great action hero. He was not a physical specimen of beefcake, but he was a cool guy. He was probably the coolest guy, one of the coolest action heroes of all time. He did ride his own motorcycle. He did a lot of his own stunts. Action heroes of the 60s and the 70s, they were ambivalent about what they were doing. Charles Bronson had to go out in the street and, and look for justice. Charles Bronson, you know, vigilantism was a, was a huge thing in movies during that period. So that kind of switched it there, I think, with Death Wish, where the good guy became like a killer. And some of the sort of violent action movies of that time you know, obviously the Clint Eastwood movies and, and Death Wish and others, those guys were the heroes and they were just going around shooting everyone that, you know, the people at home didn't like. He was always believable. Of course, he's a good actor as well as believable doing the action, which makes a huge difference. You could ask yourself a question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? It was introducing me to a level of intensity, emotional intensity, 
in action films, in adventure films, and a, a, a heightening of stakes. Here's a guy who just lives, for whatever reason, uh, he continues, he survives, but he doesn't really thrive, he just does his job. The action film stars that I grew up watching first was Jim Brown and Fred Williamson. They really had an effect on me growing up and uh, they were images that I wanted to grow up and look like, basically. Brown, Williamson, Kelly, the big three. If you were an actor or a young person, it gave you hope in the sense that you saw somebody that looked like you that was an action hero. Many of us had never seen that before. Those are my heroes first, and because I identified with them. And you know, luckily I'm in a place where I start to uh, I resonate with youngsters who were very much like me at the time. They have a lot of bang for their buck because you want to live vicariously through these people. Of course, number one is Bruce Lee. I was very influenced by Bruce. I was inspired by Bruce Lee. He was a badass, you know what I'm saying? When he came onto the screen, he was very dynamic. It was a completely a different character. Really, it was Bruce Lee that inspired me to take up martial arts. And he, throughout my whole life still now, is, is a huge inspiration. I got hip to Bruce Lee as a kid and loved him. For me, growing up, martial arts was a thing. Bruce Lee, 70s kung fu films. When Bruce Lee's movies were popular, they weren't popular in the mainstream. You could see them in some small theaters and, and only fans would know them. Uh, it was a while before I started seeing action pictures, but I guess the first one that I saw was Enter the Dragon. This is Enter the Dragon, the first martial arts film produced by a major Hollywood studio. Action is something, it's, it's deep within people. It's the same, the same way that I was inspired by, by watching, you know, Into the Dragon. Roper, Williams, and Lee, the deadly three, penetrate the secret chambers of an evil island empire. He went out and, you know, proved himself in a worldwide audience, an audience that didn't look at him as you know, some, someone who was not bankable. But he did not appeal to a wide audience. And this was something, this was also foreign. And Hollywood, traditionally, you know, they like to do what works in America, especially in those days. You know, there's an obvious transition from the 70s into the blockbuster era that started with I mean, it really started with Godfather, but then Jaws really cemented it. In terms of action, adventure, Jaws was a huge influence. That sort of everyman hero that didn't have abilities, that was just, just had pluck, just had guts, and a little bit of savvy, and was good at a job he did, but was out of his depth with this thing that he'd never encountered. Jaws changed the movie industry. Suddenly you could have a movie that could make that much money that quickly. So people started leaning towards, and the studios started leaning towards films that were gonna do that. That was kind of the gradual evolution, and then came obviously Star Wars and that whole side of it. What changes is, is to the level at which the action films are made. A lot of action films, you know, 70s, you say were serious times, politically and so forth, and that's true. But there were a lot of action films in the 70s. But in terms of, I suppose, action films uh, as a genre, and an idea. That I could have came in the 80s. Better and more complicated action scenes. So it's what the public wanted. Less dialogue, bigger body count. The 80s action films were actually shock value because that kind of excitement had never been done before. And then, you, then, of course, you, you start out the 80s and, and you have Raiders of the Lost Ark and boom, boom, one, one after another. I remember seeing the adverts for Raiders of the Lost Ark and honestly, pretending to be ill until my parents took me. I saved up to buy the VHS of, it was like $100 for the VHS, and, and I saved and scrimped, and it was Raiders. 
I memorized that soundtrack. And now since then, I've conducted that score live in concert. Huge influence on me. I think the 80s is an era that really was the golden era of, of action films. The music, I think, rose to the challenge. And it's kind of one of those chicken or the egg things. You have great scores for the great action movies of the 80s. And are those movies great partially because of the scores? And I, I say yes. If you have strong visuals and you put a dominant, really strong theme there, then basically the whole, the whole film gets like this, gets heaved up. With Raiders, you get something that is a huge hit and has a, you know, he's a flawed hero, but he's a good guy. <laughs> he's a grave robber. Good guy it, it, it didn't always get away clean. He got hurt. Whatever it was, you know, it was not always perfect. Action was the thing. Everybody wanted action. And you know what? Also today, it's the same thing. Films from the 60s, 70s, 80s, when they were really doing real stunts. If you saw a car flip over five times, somebody was in that car and it was real. Yeah, Road Warrior was everything was in camera. I mean, nobody had a clue what a computer was. And suddenly we had those movies where the action was dominant and, and within 90 minutes we had at least 45 minutes action. Action films were always getting revolutionized when, when, a, when, when a true genius comes into the fold. George Miller redefined what you could do with an action film. This is a land that prays for a hero. His films were epic, mythological. They had underpinnings. They had a great hero in Mad Max. So I think that Miller sort of took the things he liked most about about Mad Max, but certainly couldn't afford um, and didn't have the, either probably the, the cinematic expertise yet or the money to realize his vision and said, "Okay, great, that's kind of detritus or effluvium, and I'm going to use that as fertilizer and make this thing that's you know." The Road Warrior, which is a masterpiece. I was seen by Sandy Gore, who was George Miller's girlfriend at the time, and she contacted George and said, you've got to come and see this guy. So he came down and saw me. We had a cup of coffee, and we chatted about all kinds of dumb crap and nothing about the film. And about uh, a month later, my manager rang me and said, uh, they need you to fly up to Sydney for wardrobe fittings and makeup. And I went, for what? And she said, oh, uh, George Miller's um, using you in Mad Max 2, Road Warrior. And I went, what's a Mad Max 2? Road Warrior, which has got to be one of the most successful movies in history because this movie costs very little, but yet it resonates worldwide and you can watch it over and over. It was a renowned success throughout the world because action speaks louder than words. Road Warrior started a whole genre. It was like a gone with the wind of its own time and its own genre. Road Warrior today is more relevant than when we shot it. George Miller had made Mad Max and Mad Max 2, and they were having huge amounts of influence on what the action directors of the 80s were about to do. And he made them on these kind of you know, dirt poor budgets, um, but yet they arrived and became this cult phenomenon. That idea of a bunch of macho dudes or a macho guy running around with guns and crime and things blowing up kind of turned into its own genre. In the 80s, there was an opportunity for many independent producers and directors to produce a lot of so-called genre independent, low-budget genre movies or B-movies. Although they did very well, people wanted bigger and better, and that's when Arnie and uh, Sly came in at the perfect time, and you know. They were much stronger and bigger and full of muscles, and it became the standard. First Blood is a, is a key action movie. I mean, that might be the progenitor of a lot of this. John Rambo was just passing through town, but they had nothing better to do. John Rambo is this wounded vet with PTSD. <laughs> They knew he was innocent. Just another drifter that broke the law. Vagrancy, wasn't he? Uh, he's hiding out in the woods. He wants nothing to do with people. Sylvester Stallone in First Blood. First Blood, the original movie, was kind of a somber and kind of gritty. It had big action sequences, but it was 
very kind of real. And then it became this larger than life thing. It was a, a good story, very well acted, wonderfully directed. When we did First Blood, we were not thinking we're making an action movie. We, we were making a real drama, a real story. But it became such an iconic movie because watching him with all those bullets and the big machine guns and his body and all that. It was a huge hit overnight, spread like wildfire. It took actually two foreigners to make a real American story. It's funny. Without Sylvester Stallone, it all falls apart. I mean, he, sometimes he gets a, or used to get a bad rap because of the rocky, they all thought he was, he was rocky. I mean, Sly's a very bright man. You know, people want to write things off like, oh, yeah, you know, he's, a, you know, they talk about the voice and the, the tough guy thing, like he's, like he's not an intelligent, like one of the most, inte he's probably the most intelligent person in every room that he freaking walks into. Sly is the real deal in many, many ways. How did he do that? Well, he, you know, he, the big bold risk on Rocky, and he was able to deliver on that. You, know, you just realize this guy wrote Rocky. The first Rocky one was fantastic and well written, and I much admired the fact that Stallone wouldn't sell the script unless he was playing Rocky, which uh, I thought that took a lot of courage for a young guy to say, no, I played a part or you don't buy the script. It was that sort of emergence of the Stallone-Schwarzenegger era. And then, you know, cinema was about going out with your mates and sort of joining in some kind of collective experience. Barbarian. Warrior, Thief, Conan. I really miss main title sequences. Um, you know, uh, Conan is a perfect example. You go into the film knowing it's Arnold Schwarzenegger and you know it's Conan the Barbarian, but you, when you hear that brass and, and the music, it sets the tone. You have a prologue with music. Very rare, you know, it establishes the themes. But when it is, it makes it feel like a saga, it makes it feel like you're stepping into another world, it kind of gives the audience a second to just sink into the movie theater. I think the arrival of Arnold Schwarzenegger was very significant. Someone who had a name that was hard to pronounce, um, who had a very thick accent, who had this body that was just massive. I mean, we are a society, especially the female part of it, we are a society that likes to look at things like that. It was like, you know, ooh, look at those muscles. I mean, I saw Pumping Iron when the documentary when I was in high school, and I thought that was really cool. Although I did think uh, Arnold was a bit of a dick. <laughs> hey, Arnold. He just tells the truth, but it's like, and he says things, he has no filter. And so he just says what he feels like. And it's great working with him because you always know where you stand. Everything has its timing. So, for instance, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, he, he was laughed at in the beginning. You know, this this big Austrian guy with an accent who can barely speak English. But luck has it, if there is something at the right time, at the right moment, that works for the general audience, like Conan, and someone has a specific style, that can actually create a trend. I think the difference between a movie that works and people really like is having that story. And I think also having that story that the star really fits into. One day I got a phone call. Um, we want you to like, re look at the script. Uh, what needs a rewrite, which is 48 hours. Nick Nolte is a cop. Eddie Murphy is a con. They couldn't like each other less. They couldn't need each other more. You want to bet? So one of the reasons I was put on 48 Hours was, once we had cast Eddie Murphy, was to bring as much humor to, to the project as possible. Jack, tell me a story. Fuck you. Oh, that's one of my favorites. I thought it was a real movie by a passionate filmmaker that was summing up a kind of genre piece in which he scraped all the parts of the imagery and the style and the dialogue and the intensity of what he had grown up with knowing as action thrillers. So you take all the qualities of great road movies and great comedy duos, and then you sort of slot that into, you know, what on the whole were fairly formulaic cop plots. You've got something new. Uh, if you know Water Hills, ooh, Water Hills, three movies are like 48 Hours, but they're not funny at all. You've got that whole kind of approach to uh, action movies that were suddenly comedy movies at the same time. Don't you think you're being kind of hard on the guy? You go fuck yourself, convict! So out of that, we got 48 Hours and we got Beverly Hills Cop. Eddie Murphy is a Detroit cop. Hey! <laughs> on 
vacation in Beverly Hills. It was the first time that I had been involved in a, in a film that we sort of knew going in that this was a huge hit. I've been in some films that turned out to be huge hits, don't get me wrong, but, but, but that was one that we all knew sort of from the get-go that it was, and it was just such a joy working on that film. The film was written by Dan Petrie. Well, Dan was my agent. Dan had, had written this screenplay, and uh, Stallone came in and he had Cobra. And he said, here's the film we're gonna do. And they said, no, we're not gonna do that. And he said, either you do this film or I'm walking. And so they offered it to Eddie. When you're the best, you do things with style. J.J. McQuaid is the best. My wife, Elizabeth Stevens, knew Chuck Norris uh, before I did, actually, because uh, her daughter, my stepdaughter, was taking karate from one of Chuck's senior black belts. Uh, she also knew Steve Carver, who directed An Eye for an Eye. Uh, Steve invited her to see the screening of the trailer for Lone Wolf McQuaid. He's a lone wolf lawman in the Lone Star State. She saw Chuck at the screening, and Chuck said, hey, are you still going out with that guy James Bruner wrote an eye for an eye? And she said, yes, I am. She said, do you have his number? I wanted to write something. So I thought that it would be great to have a, a guy that walks softly but carries a big stick kind of, kind of, type yeah. of a concept, a guy who tries to avoid violence. The beauty about action is that you don't need translation. You can see. And the beauty about action pictures is something that is heroic. There's a bad guys and there's a good guys. And the triumph over bad guys is basically what the storyline is. Chuck was actually a real life world champion, a martial artist. And I think that really translated to people. We had kickboxing cops, kickboxing soldiers, Chuck Norris rescuing POWs. Chuck had an idea. He wanted to do uh, Missing in Action. Chuck Norris is James Brad, ex-prisoner of war. I got a call one day from Chuck. He asked me to go and have lunch with this guy in Malibu. And it was a producer named Lance Hool. He said, bring, bring the script. He's interested in it. So I went out to Malibu, met with Lance Hool, gave him the script. He liked it. And the next thing I knew, Chuck's going, so I'm going down to this new company called Canon Films, and they want to make the movie. Chuck Norris worked then for Canon for a long time, uh, making the movies with uh, Joe Zito, Invasion USA, etc. It was not a company that was making action movies at the beginning. When Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus bought Canon Film, they started to flirt with, actually with horror pictures, because horror pictures are much cheaper to produce than action. The assistant director came to me and said, downstairs, there is a call for you from Menachem. He says, you have to talk to him right now. And he said, listen, as soon as you finish to shoot this one, you're going to the Philippines and you do a movie called Ninja. I said, called what? Ninja? And he said, you know, there are action heroes and they can kick ass and I'll explain to you later. He didn't know more than that. I begged him not to do the movie, so somebody else was sent to do it. This somebody else failed in the middle, and Menachem went by himself to do it. And this was the Enter the Ninja. And so this was the, the beginning of the whole ninja things in the movies. You know, they made Enter the Ninja, I would say by accident or by chance, and it was working. They were making money. I mean, they, they were exploitationers, definitely. I mean, Death Wish 2, 3, 4. I mean, I think Roger Ebert called Death Wish 2 made by exploitationers. Canon Film was a small, medium size. In the beginning, it was a small company, became a medium size. At some point, they used to call them mini studio. That Canon, the way it would go like this, you know, at the beginning of the movie, and I, I thought, wow, you know, that even to this day, it, it like, you can, you can feel it, you know, the clung. So when I came, I did not come into a company that was making action movies. I was one of the people who created this section of Canon and swaying Canon toward action. The Ninja. 
trained in the most exquisite subtleties of combat. So Menachem Golan came to me. He was looking for a director to direct Revenge of the Ninja. So he came to me and I said, okay, Sam, you directed a movie. It's a drama. I know you can put a beginning, middle, end, but I want to give you an action movie. Can you handle action? What am I going to tell him? I cannot uh, uh, handle action? I told him, don't worry, Menachem. I will handle the action. Everything will be okay. I didn't have a clue how to start with action. <laughs> of course, I have people working with me. It's not by myself. I had a stunt coordinator, Steve Lambert. I had Shokasugi, the fight choreographer. Uh, so I had two strong action people to rely on. There's an enduring quality to the basics of these action things. That means that many generations can enjoy the tropes. And it's just that they're presented in a way that is more of their time. When Revenge of the Ninja came out, they showed the movie around, and one of the companies that saw it was MGM. And they liked the movie, and they took it for uh, distribution. Now Canon suddenly were in a different league. And that, this was the launch pad for Canon to enter the action market. When VHS started, I believe started where everybody had access to it, it was about 1976-ish. That was when, if a movie went to a VHS, it's because it failed. It was not, it was not a compliment that you were on the shelves in the video store. But by 1982, it didn't matter anymore. And by 1988, they were making movies for, for the video shelf. Success of the low budget, independent company depended solely on the explosion of the home video market. Going to a video store, just browsing, was a wonder. The fact that you could actually bring these movies home and watch them unedited, uncut. All of a sudden, everybody could watch a movie in his, at his home, and, and it was like the best time ever for the independent companies. It's just like evolution. It's what happened. It's all, it, 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 it was like, it was like sex. It's a no-no at certain times and then it becomes accepted and then it's a part of your life. Well, the same thing with off-screen movies. My favorite thing was going to the VHS store. <laughs> uh, and, oh, there's my film. You could actually hold it in your hand. So the VHS stores were really a place that was so crowded every weekend. Then we got a huge boom of, it was, it was like the boom under the boom. Because we had, we had the huge theatrical films come out. And of course, a year later, they would be on video. You know, 50 copies um, on the shelf. And under that, you'd have all the guys like Cynthia Rothrock and Richard Norton You'd have movies with these B action stars. To me, it was all the same stuff. Didn't matter about the budget. Because of the explosion of the home video market, there was a lot of money that came to the independent producers, and and it trickled down to the directors, people like me, to make those kind of movies. My films were sometimes down there, and then Van Damme's films were up here, and, I, and they was like, I was taking my film and put it there, and I put Van Damme's down there. <laughs> For me, it was, yeah, you would go to the video shop and um, it seemed like, as a teenager, there was a new martial arts film, certainly a new action film, every week. Yeah, you know, back in the 80s, I, I remember, you know, like the VHS, that the, the companies would take me to every video store and company and do all this promotion. You know, so it's interesting that we were the biggest sellers in VHS back then, but yet we never really broke out of the independent pictures. I was inspired by those guys like Don Wilson and Cynthia Rothrock and all those movies that would come out in the early 90s and they were specifically made for the video market. But in the 80s there was born a fantastic sort of school of cinematic filmmaking and storytelling that was about special effects and about huge amounts of personality. You know, why is it we remember lines from these films more than any others? Me if you want to live. Action is an extension of drama. Drama is between characters. Characters perform the action, and the action becomes a bigger manifestation than just the human side anymore, but it's always powered by the human element. From a future where men must hide underground has come a machine wrapped in flesh. As a whole, I think James Cameron 
is arguably second only probably to Spielberg in terms of influence on the whole of 80s culture, especially in terms of cinema. And you can see he was kind of born in the 80s. In some ways, he's more synonymous with that era than Spielberg as he emerged from the 70s. It's purely happenstance that, you know, of his age and his time that he arrived in the 80s because he just wanted to be a filmmaker. And he was such a forceful personality that it was almost inevitable. He's just, he's incredibly passionate about what he's interested in. And when he sets his mind on something, you know, he just has a single-minded purpose to do what he wants to do. And if you don't care that much about what is going on or your job, then there is hell to pay. And he'll step in with this amazing uh, intellect and this audacity to just assume that uh, his filmmaking and storytelling vision is as important or more so than what people tell him can and can't be done. While stuck in this dreadful Italian hotel with no money, he got the flu and had this kind of great fever dream and dreamed this image of a, of a kind of a robot or half a robot sort of clambering its way using a knife out of a burning sort of fire behind him and thus was born the Terminator. I had done a lot of low budget films and television and often you sit with the director, we have a little talk first, and he tells you what he's doing. The big picture, the philosophical picture, the picture of you know what's on his mind. And then you watch the film and you go, where is it? I don't see it, you know? And I knew this was rather low budget and Jim told me some of the things that he wanted to do and it sounded pretty ambitious and it was all there. So we knew we had something special. We, I probably would venture to say that we didn't quite know that we had something that special. I mean, because who would have known that it would become a household word? It's like Frankenstein is a household word, the Terminator is a household word. It's important to have a theme though. The 80s were, that period of time was a great time for, for film scores. So many great scores during that time, and they, it's because they had themes. In the agency that was representing me as a composer, there were the two main partners, and there was a young, younger woman. She said, there's this film and director, I really think we should try to get you there. And the word came back that this guy wanted to have a meeting with me, and I was like, fine, you know? So, so Mr. Cameron and Gail Ann Hurd came to my studio and showed me the rough cut of the Terminator. The Terminator theme, you know, that's that, you know, Brad, Brad Fidel's That's very ingrained in my mind, the original Terminator theme. I think the film would have suffered without the theme, but the use of it being judicious and not to sometimes um, overuse of the theme can kind of distance you from what's happening in the moment. But there's no doubt in the making of The Terminator, there was just the birth of a, a kind of visionary and the birth of someone who would make films with an extraordinary instinctual propulsive form of storytelling that we hadn't really had before. Imagine editing the scene where Arnold says, I'll be back at the police station for the first time. I'll be back. It became iconic. I'll be back, that's cool. If I studied something about American cinema, it was Terminator. Uh, the editing of Terminator, the speed of Terminator, the, the harshness of Terminator. I mean, all that stuff, basically, all of what Cameron did, did. It transcended the genre because it was about ideas, because it was mythic, it was a love story. It was comic in the right places. It's it self-deprecating when it needed to be. But it was classic and solid. I think Arnold Schwarzenegger has got to be one of the coolest cats on the planet. When he wants to do something, he gets it done. I mean, who would have ever thought Arnold would come here and become such a star and a governor of California? How can you go from being Mr. Universe to a movie star to Mr. Maria to governor to divorce from Maria to action hero again. How do you do that, man? Bronson's back in New York. <laughs> Death Wish 3. Acting in Death Wish 3, especially because I was actually in the middle of 
film school at the time. I, it was like a summer job I did between sophomore and junior year. It was really starkly in my face that extremely right-wing reactionary mentality of like, we are gonna take, literally gonna take the street back, right? Uh, it, it, and that's what's great about the Death Wish movies, it raises that to such a completely absurd degree. It's probably because it's a chain reaction, it's like uh, the snowball effect. If one movie up, ups the violence, the other one has to overdo it. They're genre films at the end of the day. They're not for everyone. The people in Canon, was clever, they were clever enough to look for niche area. What can they do that others don't do and maximize the profit in this area? If the audience don't buy, the studios don't make it. The studio makes what the audience likes to see. And then somehow they come up with the idea, American Ninja, boy, it makes a lot of money. For 2,000 years, the sacred art of the ninja has been guarded in the East. That ninja craze kicked up again, and my dad bought me a ninja suit, and it was the first black belt I ever got. We just mail ordered it. And uh, I put this ninja suit on, and I, I never took it off. And we would do little missions where my dad and my brother would be in the top room, watching me out on the street, and I'm like, I'm, I'm here, can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. And then I would go creeping around the gardens, and they'd have to, to keep trying to keep me in their view. And I would disappear like a ninja. Many, many, many people applied for the part of American Ninja. We definitely saw more than 300 capable, good young kid or young actor. And Michael walked into the room and this was it. I didn't have, you know, before even I talked with him, before I read, before we read any lines, just by talking, conversation, I knew this guy is the American Ninja that I had in my mind. The first few days of shooting, he was very dedicated. He took time with Mike Stone, two weeks with Mike Stone to train, to prepare himself to be American Ninja. And the first day of shooting, we were shooting, I had a very good feeling that something is happening here with this character, with this guy. <laughs> Boom, it merged together and it worked. And when the movie came out, American Ninja, it was obvious. They loved him. The audience loved him. So I was growing up seeing Bruce Lee, seeing a bit of Chuck Norris, seeing American Ninja. I'd never seen a Jackie Chan film in my life at this point. Tell a lie, I'd seen The Protector, but they were selling him as Bruce Lee and he clearly wasn't. When the Hong Kong actors started to come into the United States, it was a very good sign, especially for me as an Asian American. If you're looking for the Asian, you know, the, the, the action people, they had to come from over there because there just seemed like there wasn't very many of them that were here. There was no representative of action stars globally, especially in the United States. People like Jackie Chan, they made a, quite a bit of impact. I was training in Kung Fu. I always looked at Jackie Chan. I used to watch his movies every Sunday in Chinatown and come home and practice his movements. And I always thought, ooh, you know, I want to be like Jackie Chan. I never thought I would want to do movies. It just wasn't in my mind because it all happened by chance. He's, he's the one that, yeah, I, would, I looked at and said, yeah, that's how I want to move um, because I liked, I liked the realism in the comedy. Like he would take like a telephone and start using that as a steel whip. And I love that. And I think in some of my films, I tried to do that. Like take two frying pans and try to fight with them. Cause I, I like that cause it's real, you know? Sometimes you're not gonna be carrying a weapon on the street and you have to use whatever's available. There's a reason why we know who Jackie Chan and Jet Li and Jean-Claude Van Damme are. But yet we don't know other actors from those regions because they do action. No man, no law. No war can stop him. Sylvester Stallone is back. It took it to a new level because the stunt work was great. I mean, we had, we had a terrific crew. We had great set design. We had Jack Cardiff on camera. I mean, it was Jerry Goldsmith's score. Rambo, First Blood, Part Two. Rambo's theme by Jerry Goldsmith is absolutely the touchstone for me for 80s action. Jerry Goldsmith is my all-time favorite composer, and he always has been ever since a boy. 
Um, he really created a sense of heroism and humanity for Rambo. And when I think of that, I, I, it's immediate childhood. They've got Rambo going back to Vietnam, rescuing POWs. In other words, he's, he's atoning for the mistakes that were made beforehand. Yeah, there's a big difference uh, in that we see that sort of evolution to a branded character as opposed to an actor playing a character. First Blood was an actor's role, the other was a Stallone vehicle. So why to complicate your life and make those art movies and then go see how, where do you go, who buys it, where do you release it? You make something that, that people want and that's what they wanted. After the Rambo, there was an explosion, that's all they wanted. There's a Vietnamese officer and he's got his pistol out and he's nervous and he's firing, he's firing at Rambo, he's trying to hit him, he can't hit him. Rambo, meanwhile, is just calmly pulling back on his bow. He's got a grenade-tipped arrow. He's pulling back on the bow, and they keep cutting to this Vietnamese guy shaking and firing, and he can't hit him. Rambo lets go of the bow, and the grenade hits this guy. There's an explosion, and there's a little, you know, there's like human tissue flying. The audience went nuts, and I'm sure um, Stallone and the guys from Carol Co., Mario and Andy, were in audiences watching this also. And they realized, you know what, we, we got to take a completely different direction with these Rambo films because they're loving this. We didn't want the outgoing crowd to clash with the people coming in. We put them out the exit and immediately they joined the queue for a ticket for the next show. My parents took me to see Rambo, I think three or four times in the theater. I, I mean, we just went over and over again. I believe it was the most successful movie the year that it came out. Also, it had the most negative reviews of any movie. The fact that Rambo 2, biggest success of the year. Rambo 2, most negative reviews of the year. Here's a guy who went against the grain in everything that he ever did. Here's a guy who transformed himself, literally. He chiseled his own body into this statuesque, muscular specimen. Let's say he was very toned. It's the way he eats, the, way the, the how he exercises meticulously every day, every day, I don't know how many times a day, how many hours. This guy lives in the gym. Have you ever seen a body weigh that much and be that lean at the same time? How does a person do that? He does not eat and, and only does juice and works out. Uh, America needed a boost of confidence, and what could be more confidence boosting than a muscular physical specimen? The American audience, with the help of Hollywood, was looking to kind of elevate the feeling, the good feeling of being American. But we are talking about the subtext. We are not talking about the movies. The movies were action movies, except First Blood, maybe. Stallone goes off on this rant. And I see all those maggots at the airport. Protesting me, spitting, calling me baby killer and all kinds of vile crap. He's got a handicap. He's got a mental handicap. This was an image that people had of Vietnam veterans throughout the 70s. In First Blood, you had a guy in a big baggy army coat come back looking for his compadres and found they've all died of Agent Orange, basically. He's the last one left. And the most of that movie is him in that big jacket acting scared, vulnerable, angry, and at the end getting arrested and put away. It was a real movie, and it was really good. Then you have the sequel. Do we get to win this time? This time it's up to you. Now it's about the muscles. Now it's the superhero realm, where it's almost like a fantasy the first John Rambo had. He gets to go back and save all these buddies. He's a powerful superhero. It's no longer about losing the Vietnam War, it's about winning the Vietnam War. And guess who loves it? Ronald Reagan. I'm reminded of a recent, very popular movie. And in the spirit of Rambo, let me tell you, we're going to win this time. Ronald Reagan had this, um, uh, had this, th this macho cowboy image about him. But the world should know that this administration continues to attach the highest priority to the problem of those missing in action. There is this renewed sense of patriotism in America. In terms of the response to the times, uh, there's the Reagan era in the U.S., things were getting a lot more uh, militant, a lot more conservative, uh, a lot more reactionary. He's America's hero. It's a good feeling being number one. I mean, there's a, I have a photo with Reagan holding 
something say Rambo is a Republican, it became even political. So a lot of people copied it and a lot of, even Arnold started doing like commando and stuff like this. Vietnam played a part in the Rambo series, you know, where it was a, a veteran taking revenge, you know, for misdeeds. So that had that whole Rambo, had that whole Vietnam parallel. But I mean, Commando didn't, but I was trying to get with the current day politics. Now, somewhere, somehow, someone's gonna pay. Barry Diller said uh, he met Arnold at a party and was struck by how you know intelligent and charming he was. Nothing like, you know, uh, the Terminator or, or Conan. And he came into the studio, he had just been made head of the studio, and he said to Larry Gordon, uh, I just met Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's a charming guy. He's nothing like those characters he plays. If you can make a movie with him for $10 million, I'll green light it immediately. And a week later, we were green light with, green light with Commando. When it came to like a Commando with Schwarzenegger, that was designed as like a hero. Somebody takes his daughter, he's gonna be a hero. That movie set the tone for action movies for years to this day. I liked the script because it, you know, had several levels of action. It had comedy. Don't disturb my friend, he's dead tired. So I said, we have to put all of these laughs in the film, like one-liners, right? And the producer, Joel Silver, he said, oh, that's fantastic because a pure action movie won't make as much money. The night before shooting, I called Arnold and I said, tomorrow's shooting, you're gonna walk across the street holding this guy with your two arms and then you hang him over the cliff as you're talking to him and you drop him. And he goes, I can't do that. What do you, I said, what do you mean? You're like the strongest man in the world. You lift 400 pound weights. And he says, that's weights, those are balanced. I cannot carry a man across the street and then hold him over a cliff and do a whole scene. That's crazy. You remember Sally when I promised to kill you last? That's what made you, you did. I lied. To be honest, I don't think anybody knew that this would create the trend that it created. You're scared, motherfucker? Well, you should be, because this Green Beret's gonna kick your big ass. They were doing the next film that the, the, the producers were doing, Joel Silver, was Commando. And he actually took me and introduced me to the director, and the director said, no, I've got somebody else I want, you know? And the producer wanted him always because of Road Warrior, and then he had done some weird science, some other films with um, Joel Silver. But then we found this other guy and then we, I never shot him, but we did a rehearsal one day and he was like, oh man, we need somebody. And then, you know, it came, well, we gotta use that road warrior guy. You wanna know something? When I found out I'd get my hands on you, I said I'd do it for nothing. Vernon Wells is like the only one that could have played against him. And it was, you know, odd because he was like in love with him, but he hated him too. He wanted to kill him, but he was in love with him. This character, this, this, man wanted to be Arnold. That was the whole premise. He wanted to be number one. When we did the scene, I just sort of jumped on him and did that whole scene. And when it was over, Joel Silver said to him, he said, so what do you think? And he went, never give him a real knife. And he always says in all these interviews about, he says he's the sweetest human being but say action, and he turns into the biggest raving monster. When that movie, again, outperformed its domestic box office overseas, it kind of woke up 20th Century Fox uh, to this kind of movie and all the other majors as well. It's so famous today, everywhere he goes, everyone has seen this film. And so I think it did set off a whole genre of, you know, a whole genre of this type of movies. And I remember at the time, Stallone and Schwarzenegger, they had this uh, rivalry. Stallone was bragging on how, you know, Rambo made more money at the box office. But Arnold said, quite wisely, he said, in the long run, people are going to remember mine more. Now they're very friends and everything, but I'm sure in the old days, there was some competition. It was all about the muscles. Arnold Schwarzenegger was the reigning champ of action movies. Maybe it was Stallone. They were competing. So Stallone definitely up to the old, uh, I mean, definitely that was because of Schwarzenegger. Would he have gone to those lengths to get as big as he was, if not for Schwarzenegger? Maybe not. But that, that was the way it was back then. You know, they grew together. I made movies with both of them, so I was happy with both of them. Actually, I was going to make a movie with both of them in, in the same movie. 
and I almost, I almost got made, but then for somehow it didn't happen. Can you imagine the stress on the set having this? I remember quite vividly driving down, how, I think it was Hollywood or Sunset Boulevard, uh, when I was six years old and seeing the largest billboard I've ever seen in my life for Cobra. And that was a Warner Brothers pickup of a, of a Canon film. I, I remember my dad pointed it out. He's like, look at that. Just, just look at that thing. During my days, pe younger people than the, uh, the age that's supposed to be sneaked in the theaters. They, they, they bought, they got in. I mean, somehow they found a way to get in. This is where the law stops. And I start. My co-writer, Lenny Macaluso, and I, uh, we originally wrote The Touch with the movie uh, Cobra in mind. <laughs> is a cop called Cobra. And it didn't get in the Cobra movie, but the record label at the time, uh, Scotty Brothers, they said, oh, well, we got, we got the touch in this movie called uh, Trans well, Transformers about these cartoon robots. And we we're like, what? You got the touch. Hold on tight. The most incredible rock and roll adventure ever is here. You watch any film from the 80s and the, the music is a big part of it, the soundtrack. Beyond good, beyond evil, beyond your wildest imagination. But it worked out great, so it turned out to be a real phenomenon. This was a more innocent time. You know, we didn't have all these choices on, on your TV. I think when the record labels realized what a, a lucrative uh, potential promotional uh, vehicle this would be, uh, for, for music to, to get them in films, it was, there was more of a scramble to get those slots. And I think uh, it became more competitive as time went on to get, to get that big soundtrack cut. The inspirational rock anthem kind of thing, it, it started, kind of started with the touch. And uh, it became, after that, it, it, it seemed to be a fit, a good fit for me. That whole like upbeat sort of believe in yourself thing is, it, to me, is just great. You know, kids need sort of, they need to have uh, positive things in their lives. It was a beautiful time to be a boy and to grow up during that, that period. And these, these movies were, were made for us. The kind of aura that grew up around those films began to invent the whole geek culture. You know, we always kind of lay that at the door of Star Wars and that created it all. But I think there was a kind of following, certainly around the personalities of, of Stallone, Schwarzenegger and Kurt Russell and their like, that invented a kind of film fan and film cult that was a sort of akin to following a rock star. And in that sense, you'd wear t-shirts and you had posters and you got collectibles because that's what you did when you followed bands. Shortly after Rambo 2 came out, there were Rambo toys for an R-rated film. Makes sense to me. What was the difference between Rambo and G.I. Joe? Same thing, basically. We had more toys on that movie between the arrows, bandana, whatever it was in the movie. We had the figure of Stallone or the other characters. They were selling like pancakes. Rambo was actually a Saturday morning cartoon, which was the craziest thing uh, in my mind. You know, the fact that these toys were a little bit edgier as a kid, and I was a kid when that was happening, you know, I was psyched. I was like, good, I, I can play with this stuff. It's not too scary for me. I don't need, you know, to play with a Smurf or something. As someone who lived through that, I found it very exciting. And I didn't care at all that it was being marketed to me because I bought what I wanted. Listen, it started in the 80s. There's the whole sense of uh, high concept. You're going out there to destroy them, right? Not to study, not to bring back, but to wipe them out. I think like, at the beginning of Cameron's career, there was something of a kind of surge. As soon as The Terminator became a box office sensation, when it, it was really thought of as it was going to be a horror movie that would last one weekend, and suddenly, you know, everybody wanted to have lunch with him. Suddenly he was kind of like, he got the clout to make Aliens. He'd already written Aliens, but now he got the clout to direct it. He realized that, you know, it's the story of Ripley. It's not the story of an alien. That's kind of almost coincidental, you know. It's not about these creatures at all. It's about a woman and her journey. There's this kind of um, theory about Cameron, is that all of his films really about the creation of the, a nuclear family. All his films kind of end or with a kind of a family being sort of put back together. 
because I think he, he's kind of quite sort of conservative about family life in that sense. Hicks and Ripley and Newt as the daughter. You know, you have a nuclear family again. And, and that's inspired in the sense that everyone going in and watching these films can relate to that. When I see it now, just the, the technical, the, the practical effects, that's what's unbelievable, how those stand out. But it really it comes back to the story and Jim's script and the actors and the ensemble work. When she falls with the loader down into that sort of airlock and lands on top of the alien, there's a moment where you see it under her. And they didn't have the CG then. That was a practical effect. And it's just perfect. It makes it real. When you see it in the airlock, in that stark environment, for the first time just exposed without flashing light, and it's just squirming under her. And because it's so starkly presented, you go, get out of there, that's real. I love, it's one of my favorite moments in Aliens, is the point where the, the guys have all gone into the nest, and it's just going wrong. You know, shit is going down in the middle of this nest. It's just fantastically directed. You can't, because you, the audience can't figure it out. You see it on different screens, and it's dropping out the, you know, out the heavens on these poor guys. And Ripley takes over because Gorman can't deal with it, you know. So there he's kind of flaking out. And she just goes, right. And that's the moment she takes charge of the movie. And then the fall back. You're cut off! Do something! He goes, from now on, I'm the only one who can deal with this. And that's brilliant. But it, you, you don't even question it. It's just about you know, how brilliant the character is in that moment and how great the storytelling is. <laughs> All Detroit has a cancer. The cancer is crime. With Robocop, I, I don't think that I wanted to do anything, uh, uh, let's say, innovating. This guy is really good. He's not a guy, he's a machine. I didn't even think about American action movies. I mean, it was m my jump from Soldier of War and Turkish Delight, Spatters, into Robocop was, was the, the adventure. So completely different. And, and on top of that, and I was very inspired by a movie that was one year earlier, that was Terminator. Ronnie, we have this film called Robocop. <laughs> Robocop. The future of law enforcement. But the script was kind of considered a joke and was not considered a really serious film. Still rolling. Ah, shit! I'd spent 15 years playing nothing but Mr. Super Nice Guy, Good Guy. So if a, a role had any balls, I never got it. So I found it intriguing. So I went in and met with Paul, and meeting with Paul, then I realized that he had a vision for this film that, that, that made it the, the absolute special film that it became. It was not to do something different. I think the script was already different and the producer, John Davison, was already different than, a, say, a normal producer. They were all, they, uh, the script invited you to be different. It's not that I wanted to be different, the, the, the script ordered you to be different. In retrospect, yes, I can say, see that it is different than the movies, uh, other movies out, out of that time. But I didn't know. I exaggerated, per perhaps, because I thought it should have a, a different style than an American action movie. That it should be partially light-hearted. That it should be a bit funny. Paul grew up in World War II. He saw real violence. And his whole concept of the violence in Robocop is he wanted it to be so over the top that you, that you got the joke immediately. Ah, shit! The violence is, is underestimated. If you look at the, the paintings of the very famous uh, English artist, uh, Turner, he has, he has these battles, sea battles, with explosions and this and that. Then you could say violence close up is horrible. Violence from a distance is beautiful. There is something like that into violence. In the original concept, it was so bloody in the first couple of frames that you saw, it, 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 as, as an audience, you say, ha, I get it, I get it. It, it, it. This is where we are. Somebody want to call a goddamn paramedic? 
because they had to go back to the to the censors God knows how many times. They cut it back so much so that it finally got to where it was right on the edge of what you could stand. And they made it, the violence, more egregious by doing it that way. That's non-artistic people trying to make decisions that they have no business making. One of the most inspired movies, perhaps together with a Dutch movie like Turkish Delight, the most inspired, uh, let's say, shooting that I ever had. That film, to me, is a triumph of Paul Verhoeven. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night. In 1987, they released um, The Predator, and it's, it was remarkable for a number of reasons. One, it was at the height of the Rambo craze, and the height of the craze over Alien. Nothing like it has ever been on Earth before. What kind of works about The Predator was just the brilliance of its high concept. You know, it wasn't just an alien, it was this chameleon alien. We cannot see it, but it sees the heat of our bodies. Arnold Schwarzenegger in Predator. We got this kind of gang of macho idiots that were all kind of rivals to one another. Carl Weathers and Jesse Ventura, you know, all these kind of ridiculous people who were more ridiculous than Arnold, you know. They made Arnold look like the straight guy. But then you saw a film where Schwarzenegger actually went beyond and tried in that movie to really act. And the result was a guy who was scared. You saw Schwarzenegger for the first time ever express fear. When we got to Puerto Vallarta, which is where we shot most of it and went to Palenque down by the pyramids. Arnold, I think it was two ballrooms, and he had two tractor and trailers bring gyms to those ballrooms. They would get up at three o'clock, run miles, then come back to the gym, work out for an hour, hour and a half, eat breakfast after that, and go to the set. I did it for a week, and after that, I just went to the set. Rather than becoming just a daft film like Raw Deal or Commando even, which are kind of cherished, you know, for their nonsense, Predator was kind of exciting. I think that had a lot to do with McTiernan as a director. Filmically, there's, I don't think there's anybody that tells stories better with a camera than John McTiernan. He understands actors and, and brings the best out of you. Uh, so we were in good company. He had a skill with taking the um, the tenets of 80s action movies, but giving them um, a kind of robustness. You know, Die Hard is great because there's something just robust about its storytelling. His kind of Cameron skills, in a way, where he's so good at keeping a film going, going and going, going, yet the story has a shape. It just comes together as a thrill ride. It, you know, there's, there's the humor in it, there's the strangeness of it, there's occasional moments where it breaks out and doesn't work, like when he's a stick around, you know, no one, I mean, at that point, it was not appropriate to do the tradi traditionally branded Schwarzenegger lines. It was also a good science fiction movie that, you know, you felt created a kind of world and, and a franchise that could be invested in in its own right. Um, so it kind of, again, mixed the kind of pleasures, the idle pleasures of the great 80s movie with something a bit more alien-like, a bit more Star Wars-y, um, that had a, just a bit more weight to it. You've got a movie that brings up the best and worst of the 80s. It's a perfect slice of 80s, of, of what pulp does best. It manages to avoid the pitfalls, and it avoids, you know, the cheesy uh, movies that it could have been. What's interesting about Lethal Weapon was it kind of sort of swung the pendulum back slightly. He's a criminal's worst nightmare, a cop who enjoys the danger. It took you know, the basic tenets of, of comedy, but took, did it with two, since we straight actors. He was ready to retire. Now, he's gonna wish he had. The archetypes for me, the ones I draw from, they're more often something I read than something I saw in a movie, which is good, because it gives me this sort of, you know, little known advantage. It's little known, I mean, anyone could read, but so few actually do. It's all there. All the influences, which are always two steps ahead of what movies are currently portraying, all the sort of complex uh, action, adventure, private eye, all, all these sort of genre heroes, you make those, you put those shapes in your head much more effectively when you combine movies with a library of stuff. And since I was a kid, 
I have been addicted to the retreat and the sort of uh, isolation that books provide. So I look at Lethal Weapon and I say, yeah, Dirty Harry, 48 hours. But it's more just, you know, um, Ed McBain's 87th Precinct. And what was fun about it, knowing about it, was that one of them was Mad Max. And I think thinking with Lethal Weapons, you could bring something of Mad Max, the sort of the spirit of Mad Max, because and in the presence of Mel Gibson, it kind of just carried over. Hey, you want to see crazy? I'll tell you. <laughs> the thing we hadn't quite realised about Mel Gibson that he's a bit nuts, you know, that he was quite highly strung, and that it kind of worked. You know, he's kind of cool as Mad Max, but once you kind of let him off the leash a bit, he's a bit odd and a bit edgy and discomforting. But it was guys who were very vulnerable. And the best ones, even the toughest ones, the best parts of the films for me, even Dirty Harry, was where they were sort of in between and vulnerable. Where you saw that they're really good at their job, but they're really fractured as people. And that's what influenced me the most. I think that's what encouraged me to make the Mel Gibson character in Lethal Weapon not just a really good cop, but a fractured cop. And he put him opposite, you know, a weary, you know, aging kind of black cop in the brilliant Danny Glover. And you have kind of everything that would work, you know, opposites, comedy, straight man, comedian. You know, I, I look back on it, do I remember the action scenes per se? Not, I can't bring them absolutely to mind. There are great action sequences, but I just remember their interaction and the way they played off each other more than anything. And that's, you know, I think just a great recalibration of the grand tradition of the odd couple. You ever met anybody you didn't kill? Well, I haven't killed you yet. The Lethal Weapon franchise is interesting. I did uh, the, uh, work with Donner on the first one. The second one, I wrote a draft. It was good. It was a fairly depressing draft and needed a bit of work. But mo the work it needed was not so much the issue as the somberness of it. Uh, that second one was very much in the realm of uh, sort of the dirty hairy of uh, tough, 70s driven, you know, more like bullet than Animal House. They wanted like the Joe Pesci of it. They wanted, they wanted a lot more humor. And I didn't dig that. I thought it was gonna be a feel good, fun ass movie. And I thought, well, it's not so much where, kind of like a taut, suspenseful thriller. And that was where it parted. It was, part of it was I killed Briggs at the end. I didn't have to do that. They call that sending away the bread truck, basically. But in retrospect, you know, I was probably being a little too somber and too pretentious about, but it was enough for me to say, look, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want a comedy. I'd rather do uh, something different. Lethal Weapon 2. This time, they're not taking any crap. Just get off me, man. I don't want anybody to see us like that. Die Hard is based on a novel called Nothing Lasts Forever, which itself is a sequel to another novel by the same author called The Detective. Interestingly enough, The Detective was a movie made with Frank Sinatra produced and starred in, uh, I think in the late 60s. Curiously enough, because it was the same author and the same book series, Fox had to offer Die Hard, but under the title of Nothing Lasts Forever, to Sinatra. Fortunately, he said, I'm too old and too rich uh, to do this, which is good because otherwise the chases in the building would be on rascal scooters. Willis, that was an interesting choice. He was a funny guy. It was a TV show, Moonlighting. Casting him in uh, Die Hard was, was brilliant. I tried to make Bruce as grounded as possible. I was already aware of the overworked, overbuilt, you know, steroid, muscular hero, which becomes problematic. Who do you have to fight him? After Schwarzenegger, he, Willis sort of started the more regular sized human being kind of action hero. So when I construct an action movie, I, the first thing I think of is the villain, you know? So the protagonist of Die Hard is really Hans Gruber and the antagonist is uh, John McClane. Oops. No bullets. You think I'm fucking stupid, Hans? And if you think about it that way in your mind, you end up getting the cat and mouse chess game. I do think that Die Hard still to my mind is one of the top 
five, if not the best, um, action films ever made. Um, it's exciting, the big sequences are great, it's incredibly well plotted, they have great characters, great actors, McTiernan was the perfect director, Jan de Bont was the perfect cinematographer, um, you know, one of the best bad guys in, in film history, uh, which is incredibly important. Alan Rickman, you know, which I thought was incredible, but I, I, I talked about him many times saying, this guy's talking too slow. This is not going to work. And then when it comes out on film, he's incredible. Due to the Nakatomi Corporation's legacy of greed around the globe, they're about to be taught a lesson in the real use of power. And I also love that sense of it being contained. There's something about that if it's just all taking place in this one building. You get the logic of it. You get the the sense of the challenge for the the the, the bad guy, the good guy, and in the back of your mind for the writers and the filmmakers. You know, it's just how are they going to make this work? Well, I think what happened post a Die Hard is a lot of people did this Die Hard and it became shorthand for a movie pitch. Not everybody did what we did, which was have an ordinary guy. So, for example, Under Siege, oh, you think he's an ordinary guy, but oh, it turns out he actually was a Navy SEAL who got demoted because he punched an officer. Die Hard is one that if I'm flipping channels and it's on, I'll say, I'll wait, I'll just gonna wait to the scene, which they put in late in the game, which is Hans Gruber going up and looking around and running into McLean. Hi there. And going, no, 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 don't shoot me. Oh my God, that scene, I love that scene so much. Um, and then I end up watching the whole film. Bruce Willis, Die Hard. In the late 80s, I, I remember how huge some of these R-rated films like Terminator 2 and and Rambo 3. I remember how big those movies were and how expensive they were. I want you to come with me to help me lead the team. What do you say, John? I put in my time. Rambo is never looking for a fight. You've got to force him to fight. And that was one discussion that Stallone and I had about Rambo 3. Uh, we've got this war going on in Afghanistan. It's the, it's Russia's version of Vietnam. Bad, there were bad Russians in Rambo 2. Rambo 3, well, Russians, let's have Russians again, but where are they causing a, a lot of trouble? Where are they killing people? Afghanistan, Rambo's gotta go to Afghanistan. Who are you? The worst nightmare. Stallone. Rambo 3. We had less luck, I think, on Rambo 3 because of political climate had changed. I did mention to them when we were shooting Rambo 3 that glasnost was happening and people were shaking hands, not kidding each other, but um, I was a little bit ignored about that. <laughs> First of all, Peter McDonald was not the director initially. It was Russell Mulcahy. Russell actually directed the film for, I think, the first couple of weeks before he got fired. Sly was not very happy. Rushes were dark or something. Maybe the guy was intimidated by Sly, or maybe, I, I have no idea. I wasn't there, into, I just came uh, when the thing started to happen. And, I, and then they, we all got together and said, okay, well, this, unfortunately it's not working with him, but we, we're making the movie. So we have uh, uh, the second uh, unit director, which is Peter. On Rambo 3, I was directing and photographing the uh, second unit, as I had done on Rambo 2. During that period, I took over photographing the first unit for two or three days, and they were quite well behind schedule. Stallone asked me into his trailer, which is as big as a normal house, and then asked me about um, taking over the film. And I really was very dubious, because I knew I was going to inherit as the film's first film I was going to direct. It was a totally out of control film. So I, I looked outside, I said, all these people now are going to be sacked. So I said, well, I'd do it, I said, so. It's a pretty damn good movie. And, and, you know, in retrospect, so many people are saying that Rambo 3 is their favorite of all the Rambo movies. Personally, I like Rambo 2, but back then, uh, they, had, they just felt that they had to hate it. Fuck them. Sly did say to me, this fool, you realize this is going to change your life. And I did, with, I said, you know, for, for better or for worse. And I'm still trying to work out whether it was for better or for worse. No! You know, it's been a while since there's been any good martial arts movies. Sooner or later, they're going to make a resurgence. And then bang. Blood sport. Now, for the first time, the true story of America's super agent, Frank Dukes, can be revealed. 
Jean-Claude Van Damme came to our office and he just wanted a part in a movie. Whoever came out, any of the executives, he would start doing his splits and, and somersaults and stuff. And then Menachem Golan, who was the head of the company, uh, said, okay, we'll do Bloodsport. I had been introduced to Frank Dukes a few years earlier. He was telling me these stories about this Kumite tournament that he participated in. And he had an article that was in Black Belt Magazine. That's when he told me this um, competition used to get very bloody. So uh, we had a nickname for it, which is Bloodsport. Somebody had suggested you should go check out this movie, No Retreat, No Surrender, in which Jean-Claude played a villain. He played, you know, Ivan the Russian was the name of his character. And we were just blown away by the guy. Frank Dukes met Jean-Claude. According to Frank, they had some training sessions. You know, he showed Jean-Claude a bunch of stuff. I doubt it. Jean-Claude knew far more than Frank ever knew. In fact, Bloodsport sat on the shelf for about two years, if I'm not mistaken, before they finally released it because Mon Menachem thought it was a terrible movie. And actually, the first cut was really bad. It was bad. I saw the first cut, Jean-Claude, so we all saw it. We all thought, wow, this movie's a mess. And they brought in a guy. They have a, like a film doctor, but he basically recut the movie. He allowed Jean-Claude to come in the editing room. Jean-Claude helped a lot with the action scenes. But until that was all that work was done, the movie looked pretty bad, and Menachem thought it was a piece of shit. I mean, I'm quoting, you know, it's a piece of shit. Jean-Claude's a loser. He's poison. Poison was his word for Jean-Claude. This is before Bloodsport had been released. It gets released, and suddenly he does a one, complete 180, and now he wants to put Jean-Claude in as many movies as he can, but he's only got a three-picture deal with him. When I saw Bloodsport, when I was 12, 13, and that's an age where, you know, you kind of can work out between 12 and 16, you, you kind of work out what you want to be, I, I think, for the most part. And for me, it was seeing Bloodsport and realizing that that's what I wanted to do. I was so inspired by Bloodsport and Van Damme that I remember calling my mom in and saying, look, watch, watch this guy. That's what I want to do with my life. I want to do what he does. A team is not a team if you don't give a damn about one another. The reason that I made Best of the Best was something uh, that was very close to my heart. What does it take to turn five uncontrollable characters into one unbeatable team? I represented USA in the 1980 Olympics in Korea. There was five guys who made it. And that experience was phenomenal for me. I wanted to share that story into a movie. And that's how Best of the Best was made. I accepted that job in Best of the Best Part 1 because I loved the script. We choreographed those fights before we shot anything. And Simon Ree was basically the fight choreographer on all the movies. And uh, you did what Simon told you to do. Simon says, do this, do this, do this. Oh, wait, do this, hey. Just like that. Seizing Quan attacks. Greedy counters with a two down and scores. Oh, down, down, down. For me, I wanted to be grounded. Let's do our actions wide shots so we could see the technique rather than go boom, 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 and keep it really tight and you don't see what the heck is going on. I have never been more surprised to be in a hit that big. That was a giant smash of a hit. Part one did really well. Part two did phenomenally well. Part two is okay. Part three and four aren't very great. I got a call from the Bob and uh, Harvey Weinstein's company. We want to do best of the best three. And after that, they called me back again and said, we want to do best four. You write it, you direct it, you produce it, and you star in it, and we'll write you a check. I am the only Asian American to ever write, produce, direct, and star in a movie in America. And that's a shame. Cynthia Rothrock is China O'Brien. In the beginning, at first, I was like, 
there was always the guy that would come in and save the day and I would fight and then he would come in and save the day. So uh, it, it, that was a little bit different as being the lead in the American pictures. And it took until I think China O'Brien, but then Lady Dragon. And then when they realized that those movies were really successful and made a lot of money, I was the lead pretty much after that. For me, it was a glorious time as a teenager. Every week go to the video shop and there'd be a new like China O'Brien or you know, Bloodfest or whatever it was. When we were shooting China O'Brien, I did find a big difference in shooting with Robert Klaus and shooting in the Hong Kong. Um, because remember, that's all I had was Hong Kong experience. Uh, he wanted to do everything in one long shot and one long take. And I was used to them, you know, doing that, but coming in for close-ups, close-up of the foot to the head and this and that. And we'd be like, no, but wait, you have to come in and do the close-up of it. And he'd go, well, Bruce Lee didn't do that. <laughs> At that time, I think I was just as up there with everybody else. You know, my movies were making top money, so I never, I never felt inferior in the market. Uh, any Hong Kong movie that I did, uh, that's my favorite fight scenes. <laughs> On my films, I think what I'm really proud of is actually righting wrongs uh, or above the law. The fight scenes were phenomenal. Yes, madam. The Chinese uh, people really embraced me uh, because they haven't, they weren't used to seeing a white woman that could fight so hard. And I remember the first day of filming, uh, we had an all-night shoot, and it was in the airport scene of Yes, Madam. And uh, it was very tough and it was brutal and it, I didn't know what to do so I just said I'm just gonna do my best if I get hurt I get hurt you know so I gave it all and I think that first day it impressed everybody and the stunt people because they could hit me hard and I wasn't gonna complain you know and they weren't oh no she's not you know we don't have to put on the delicate gloves for her because she's a girl I think once they realized how tough I was and I could fight just as strong as the men I gained a lot of respect that day. The idea of the female action hero. I don't think it quite took hold. There's, there's an interesting sort of like almost sort of sub-genre, you know, within the 80s, uh, which was created, I think, ostensibly by a decision Ridley Scott made uh, in 1978 when he was filming Alien, where someone said, why don't we just make Ripley a female? And they did this, and this I think the really key bit, obviously Scorny Weaver is amazing and the casting of her is important, but I think what's really important is they didn't change a line of dialogue. So nothing about Ripley's dialogue was changed to make her female. We know it's using the air shafts. Will you listen to me, Parker? Shut up! She was pretty fierce, and I think it's, I think it was, it was a very empowering thing, for, even for me, to see a woman in a movie just be that effortlessly cool, intense, and, and, and effective. Never gave up. Cameron drew a lot from that. Yeah, he loved Alien. I think he loved that idea that, you know, females could be tough. You're a terminated fucker. Really, it's her arc is she becomes Ripley. You know, she finds the facility to survive. The transformation of Linda Hamilton from the victim to the hero was really shocking. It's a chance to do the suspense genre, but to channel something that was a little more rare going into the 80s or 90s, which was a woman who was lethal, a woman who had the same sort of admirable yet frightening skills that we found in previously male heroes. Being Vasquez was, was really um, an incredible opportunity. When I was discussing with Jim about how I wanted to play her, and I said, well, she's not gonna be likable. There was this thing also like in the 80s, especially in television, where you had to relate to the character. They had, you had to be relatable, likable, and I was like, I'm not, I'm gonna play her who she is and how she is and I'm not gonna be that way. And he said, that's great. I've got your back, don't worry about it. There is of course the, the, the situation of the male dominance eh, that has been there for a couple of, uh, for thousands of years in fact. When I grew up, then I went to uh, elementary school, the women in the class were as, as clever or mostly better than I. So I have never seen a difference. 
I thought basically, the, yeah, they look different, and of course there is a, certainly biologically there is a, there is a difference clearly, but here there is no difference. For a long time in Holland, by coincidence, because how I started, there were a lot of male parts because I like to work with Rutger Hauer. And here uh, in the United States, at a certain moment, basically, uh, there were female parts, like the, the one of Sharon Stone, and it moved to that direction. So I, I don't see the difference. I think uh, the pickings are slim as far as female action stars is because there's a stigma, I think, and it's that same old thing, you know, well, women don't sell as good as the men or something like that. There was a lot of uh, pressure when we did The Long Kiss Goodnight, um, and Halfway through, I had told some people what I was doing, including various producers. They said, what are you working on? I said, this thing with a female uh, protagonist. And across the board, they said, dude, that's not, if you want that to sell, you, can't you make him a, a man? I mean, why does it have to be a woman? And I would explain the sort of dichotomy of the woman who's desperately living that sort of housewife mentality to shield herself from uh, the memory of, of the things that she can't abide. They said, well, just do it with a guy. And I just, no, it, it, it didn't feel interesting if you put a man in there. It had to be this woman. As I got more into it and we got Gina involved, it became a really powerful film that ultimately the critics who had said use a man, box office-wise, they were probably right. Story-wise, they were wrong. It didn't work with a man. It was a perfect woman role. It didn't sell. Whoever set us up is really connected. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Relax. So. Tanko and Cash was a, 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 an interesting experience because you had this diverse group. John Peters producing Sly, um, Kurt, and Andre Konchalowski directing, who Andre had directed you know, a couple of good films, but they were very different to what we were making and I had an office next to Andre and um, I was sitting there with my assistant we heard John Peters outside in the car park shouting out to Andre, don't forget you're making a buddy buddy film. At the time Andre, it was, English wasn't that good at the time and he came to his Romanian assistant and said, what is bud, buddy buddy, look up buddy buddy. And I thought then, well, we're probably in a bit of trouble here because it's a, a genre that um, the director didn't understand, you know. They went way behind schedule. I mean, I was the executive producer and directed the second unit. The uh, studio said after week two or three, this is not working. Instead of that, they waited till week 14 just to say, this isn't working. And I said to them, we've only got two weeks to go. I mean, you're sacking Andre with two weeks to go. That's fairly stupid, you know. So, um, but they did, and it was fairly stupid, you know. It was John Peters that, um, made a suggestion about the end action sequence where we had these great big earth movers because he'd drive into the studio, he'd pass his earth mover working down the road and he said, I want a whole sequence with 12 of these, you know. So I said, well, it costs 500,000 each, maybe we can do it with, um, with less, you know. So he, he had the idea of making it bigger. Sly and Kurt wanted to make it a more thoughtful film and I think it was John that wanted to make it a more kind of, wow, this is the biggest action film in history. The film worked okay. I mean, it's, um, it could have been better, but what film couldn't be better? And it, I think it made them money. And there was always talk about making another one, which in a way is quite good, because there's a good chemistry between Kurt and uh, Sly, you know. And I must say, Kurt's a charming, a really charming guy, and very easy to work with, you know, and it makes life so much easier. So best is Stallone and Kurt Russell, <laughs> Tango and Cash. Uh, early 80s, Arnold wanted to do Total Recall. Dino refused. Company of Dino there went, let's say, uh, bankrupt or something like that. Arnold basically called Mario Casar and said, buy the script. <laughs> I took that movie because of the ambiguity. Great. Cut. Get ready for a surprise! I, I, I think the idea that you don't know if Arnold is dreaming or if it's true felt postmodern. You know, there are two realities. And they, they, comp they don't even compete with each other, they're next to each other. That was the funny thing about Total Recall. It felt 
like the lowest low budget film I've ever made. They cut so many corners. At one point they called me up and they said, Ronnie, this is an expensive film. So I said, everybody's agreed to fly down uh, to Mexico in coach. Are you telling me that Arnold Schwarzenegger is flying coach? And they said, well, no, not Arnold. So I said, well, no, not Ronnie. Do you think you could play along? Yes, sir. Great, because otherwise I'll erase your ass. Obviously, they were spending a lot of money on the screen, and those were the biggest, most wonderful sets at that time. The technology was not nearly what it is today, so it could take you a day to get a shot. We were really very hard trying to make the script through both ways that it would be a dream, and he is still in the factory, and at the end of the movie, he's, he is basically uh, wiped out. Or he is a really a wonderful guy that basically uh, is, is abused by Cohagen, uh, the, the bad guy, but finds out his humanity, and at the end, saves the world, isn't it? Uh, the world of Mars. These two th things, they're true too. You never know if it's real or not. Arnold put his stamp on the movie so much, I've never seen that, basically. Uh, all for the good, eh? always on my side, always preparing, always uh, uh, if production was, uh, was basically uh, difficult and uh, they didn't want to pay because the, the scene was too, 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 uh, too expensive. Arnold would say, I want the scene. Paul Verhoeven was making Total Recall then, you know, which was the most exciting Schwarzenegger movie ever. And Cameron was going to turn up and make one that was twice as good and twice as expensive and twice as Schwarzenegger than ever before. When I, when I decided to go ahead with Terminator 2, I got so much flag from, you name it, the Hollywood Reporter, Variety, CNN, I'm going to bank up Carco, I'm crazy, I'm overspending, but you name it all. Success has many fathers. At the end, it was a big hit. They all said, of course. Terminator 2 was a classic example where that felt like a great use of money. You know, when you went to see T2, you felt like, okay, they took what was already a great movie and made something that was so much bigger. They're both great movies, but arguably better. That never felt like a waste of money to me. Everyone expected a sequel sooner, and then after a while, people started to learn about Mr. Cameron, and he, you know, he takes time between things. And then he had this kind of inspired idea of, you know, can I go one better than, than the T-800, the Arnold one? How do I make a worse one? And he created this idea of the liquid metal. And then he had to figure out how to make the liquid metal. Uh, James did something very, very smart and very expensive. He perfected the special effects and showed me a reel of the special effects that you see in the movie before we start really shooting. So we spend, I don't know how many millions of dollars in doing the chrome guy, the, the finger that goes like this, then the guy that comes out from the floor. And when you start seeing all this, you say, oh my God, this is going somewhere amazing. What expanded with Terminator 2 was not just the level of action and the level of excitement it was also going to be a special effects revolution as well. And when I saw the T-1000 and I came up with the stuff that kind of almost made you nauseous when you listened to it because I felt like the visual was so groundbreaking that the music had to m meet that bar and not be any cliché of music that we know because we are now seeing something we've never seen before. Which is, I wanted to disorient the audience somewhat. It was like these weird samples of, of brass sections ba backward and upside down that I was stretching out and playing with so that you kind of got this, you know, because like all of a sudden reality isn't reality. It's like you go to do something and you go right through it, but it's not a ghost, it's a thing that can kill you. <laughs> what I love about Terminator 2 is the characters and the humor, the idea of Arnold Schwarzenegger sort of being a good Terminator. That's definitely you. If I ever sat alone in a room with Cameron and say, Avatar's great and all that, and you're doing such amazing things, but you're the guy who flew a helicopter under a freeway bridge, 
and you've not bettered that. In some ways, Terminator is kind of like the cusp, isn't it? It's the kind of culmination of, of uh, the great A20, although it's 91, I know that, you know. It's the point where the, all the 80s stuff had done as much as it could possibly do, and you can feel the kind of the move toward CGI and Jurassic Park, all the things that were just around the corner. So and it's a film almost to be celebrated, you know, as the last great hurrah. Um, but at the same time, it's just another wonderful piece of storytelling. There was a period of time where the John Woo style was very prevalent. I think John Woo had a huge impact on me and Adam Leff. Um, we watched, I remember watching The Killer and just thinking, oh my God, this is better than any Hollywood action movie because we thought this is really the kind of action, this is just better. In terms of the stylization of the action and the way it was shot. Everyone I knew in Hollywood was watching those movies. One of the executives in Warner Brothers, they said, why do you want to use these guys? They don't even shoot sync sound. And they kind of disrespected John at that time. So then Universal sued John Woo and he made Hard Target with Van Damme. So Van Damme, he went through this period where he was the guy bringing in these Hong Kong directors, right? John Woo, Ringo Lam, Choi Hark, he was sort of the guy to, to bring them to Hollywood and, and it made perfect sense because obviously martial arts is a big part of it. Not so much with John Woo, funnily enough. But that style, it stuck around. Um, you know, it, it really did influence Hollywood for a, for a period of time. The ultimate weapons of the future have declared war on each other. I kind of discovered Roland Emmerich when he was down in my in my building, he did a movie called a very small movie. I don't I don't remember. It's a, future, a very futuristic movie that cost nothing that he did. And I wanted to meet him after I saw the movie, and I met him. He's a wonderful guy, very very smart and very creative. Jean Claude Van Damme, Dolph Lundgren, Universal Soldier. I had the screenplay called Universal Soldier, where I managed to put. Van Damme, who came to Cannes and came Mario, I want to make a movie with you, and that. at the right time, right? So I get the screenplay with, I needed two guys that were all represented by the same lawyer, Jake Bloom, who was our lawyer at, at, at that time. He was very nice, very helpful. And I said, look, I want to try to put Jean-Claude and Dolph together in this movie, and I'm going to have this German director, Roland Emmerich, do it. And it was actually the first big hit of Van Damme that cost a certain amount, and from there on, of course, it became more and more famous and, and more, more expensive, and it worked. So that I did it, not because I wanted to be in, in the sci-fi movies, but that was the story that I liked about it. I am in the original Universal Soldier, but you need the pause button to see me. It's in the early part. It's in the Vietnam flashback. It's, it's Jean-Claude and I in the foxhole. And I run off and, you know, I guess I get blown up and put on ice and come back eight years, years later as the, as the bad guy, as Seth. <laughs> I guess you can look at it like that. Studios are making pictures for the largest common denominator of people. They want to get as many seats in that theater and paid seats as they can. Now they need the, the, the date uh, crowd. They need the women to come with them into the theater. Maybe younger audience. The original Cornucopia, the studios, were chasing was the foreign box office, which liked the R-rated hard action movie, bloodshed, action, mayhem, and uh, a plot that is not dependent on dialogue. They saw what happened with the Ninja Turtles that appealed to everybody. Hey, there's toys and hamburgers to be had here, We, but they have to be PG-13, PG let's rein that back in. And there were the franchise elements. There were the books and hats and t-shirts and cups and mugs and in some of the cases almost made as much money sometimes as the movies. Arnold Schwarzenegger is Jack Slater. Whoa! This hero stuff has its limits. I mean it started as me saying to my writing partner Adam we should do 
a reverse Purple Rose of Cairo. The bad guys are in there. I've seen it on screen. Could I speak to the drug dealer of the house, please? Where a kid goes into a movie and it's an action movie and we get to live out all of our fantasies as fans. And the idea that you, as a fan, by knowing the genre, would actually have a huge advantage just seemed to me, who wouldn't want to see that movie? That just seems like exactly what I would have wanted to see when I was younger. I mean, I was only 22 at the time. I think you could definitely say that Last Action Hero turned into the classic snake that eats its own tail. It definitely was a weird moment to to be parodying certain people and then have those people um, take over the movie. It was a chance for us to step in and take this sort of uh, basic idea of lampooning uh, the current action genre. But I wanted to take it a little further. Now, eventually the, the writers of that script that originally, they didn't like what we did. And they were pretty vocal about not liking what we did. And that's fine. Then, they, then something fun happened, which is someone did what, what, we, what Zach thought we did to his script, then got done to our script, and we said, hey, we don't like it, because it got taken away from us. It became less about, you know, suspense, adventure, detective stuff, cop stuff, and more just about a big world of movies with dinosaurs and things like that. And it, it, it was, in other words, the spectacle of just movie world as opposed to cop movie world sort of overwhelmed. I, I think a lot of problems probably came out later in the process too, but I do think there's something to be said for two total movie buffs writing this movie where we loved that genre. We thought, you know, we didn't sit there and say, oh, Commando, this is so stupid. We thought it was awesome. Whereas I think, you know, for McTiernan and for Shane and for a lot of those people, they had kind of gotten tired of this stupid version of what they, I mean, Shane writes the smart version of those movies, right? I mean, Lethal Weapon is the smart buddy cop, it's the better buddy cop movie. There's a lot of crappy ones, he writes the good ones. I think with Last Action Hero, even when I first saw it, it's not like there aren't a whole bunch of great moments in the movie. I mean, there's a couple left over from our draft, but there's also, you know, the dogs that form a pyramid and everything with Charles Dance is great. I've just shot somebody. I did it on purpose. It was very hard for me to watch it at the time because I really had no idea what I was getting into. If I was at the premiere and afterwards there was this bubble of silence and uh, it was the only time I went to a premiere back then of something I'd written. And I just went, eh, I'm not that excited. I'm glad I did it, but Great party. We went and they had Kiss playing and they had like giant statues and you know, all the food you can eat. Now, this is good food. I'm glad we made that movie because I'm having a great snack. But meanwhile, no one's talking about the movie. No one liked it. There's so many people who love the movie and there's so many people who at least acknowledge one thing that I even felt at the time was this is a deeply weird movie. This is one of the weirdest big budget movies that anyone's ever made and the fact that people appreciate that now is hard for me to, you know, I'm not gonna dissuade someone from feeling that way. Um, and, and I do think it's aged much better than people expected. If my $20 billion are not delivered, the hostages will die. I don't think so. The Capcom executives are coming to Hollywood. They're having a round of meetings with producers all over town looking for someone to make a movie out of their successful game, Street Fighter II. Do you understand, do you know this? And I said, yeah, my kids have put like their college fund into that coin op machine. Can you have a, a, a story to tell them, an approach to this movie in three days? With this like crazy schedule and stuff like that, I'll only take this assignment if I can direct the movie as well. So I don't want to do another tournament movie. So I came up with more of a G.I. Joe. In other words, people have said to me since then, you actually made the first G.I. Joe movie. I just decided that General Bison was the ideal person to be the villain. I'm looking at the cast of characters. And since the characters were all international fighters, I thought they come together because the UN uh, go, goes through. I invented uh, roles for everybody. So I pitched this to them in the meeting and, and they go crazy. And they were on the same wavelength. They showed me a sketch of Bison's underground base with missiles and stuff. So I inadvertently pitch them something they were thinking of doing. But anyway, they had a budget in mind, and so the first couple names in their list, you know, Stallone, Schwarzenegger, the obvious choices, they were unaffordable, 
And then they said Van Dam, and could be Ford Van Dam. We go well, probably, but he has his accent, and they go, what accent? Because they're only hearing him dubbed. Now, are you the same as Sagat and Bison, or am I right? And you're different. Isn't there a danger putting Van Dam in the movie that people are going to expect an R-rated movie? Because you wanted PG-13, so that was nagging at me. But they were adamant about that. I mean, I completely understand why Van Dam did Street Fighter at the time. It was a massive payday, and it was a big property. It was a big film. Everyone's going to go and watch it. For General Bison, our first choice was Stephen Lang, who was the wonderful villain uh, in Avatar. And he came in and read for us. He was phenomenal. But uh, the Japanese, they were just, they were really into uh, this marquee value. And Rao Julia was a much bigger name. And as it turned out, his children played the video game. So he knew it. And he said, all right, I'll do a, uh, uh, a popcorn movie for my kids. Game over! Right before the movie came out, the censorship board, even though I, without doubt, had done a PG-13 movie, they rated it R. You cannot advertise toys for an R-rated movie on Saturday morning television. I had to start cutting back on the fights, on the impact, on any blood. We turned it in again. It was rated R again. So now we cut deeper into the fights, and we turn it in, and they rated it G. We're like, oh my God, that's the kiss of death in another way because no teenager is going to want to see a G-rated movie. That's a Disney rating. So I had John Claude come back in and give me one wild line where he said, four years of ROTC for this shit. Oh. And then we submitted it again. They go, well, you have to get PG-13 now with that curse word. It, it, it was a very profitable movie. It made over $100 million. It's only one of two Van Damme movies that broke $100 million. That and Time Cop. It wasn't the, the best film. I think most people agree, especially as a fan of Street Fighter. You know, it's very different to what the original concept yeah. is. You know, for Van Damme to do that, you know, it didn't, didn't put it past him at all. It's like, yeah, go, go for it. It's a big, big payday, big film. You know, it's a bit more for the kids. Uh, go for it. You have made me a happy man. Next, I'll make you a dead one. Yeah! It true lies is um, almost the exception that proves the rule, I think, in Cameron's films. I'm sure it was sold in as, what if James Cameron directed a, a Bond movie with Schwarzenegger in? What would it be like? For 15 years, Harry Tasker's been leading a double life. Mr. President, one of our best men is inside. Transmitting now. It's the one he didn't originate, um, so it came through Schwarzenegger, it was a Schwarzenegger project, and I think he persuaded Cameron to do it. I think he came into it almost like a director for hire, and I think that kind of interested him. So it's a slight anomaly in terms of his career as a whole, and I think that counts sort of tonally as well, that it's got this sort of comic spy edge to it. It has this kind of um, really interesting Jamie Lee Curtis sort of subplot, or you could say plot. You know, obviously she's the wife of, of Schwarzenegger's secret agent and has no idea what he does. So it's a sort of domestic problem. Again, we come back to Cameron's sort of fascination with the family unit. True Lies, I think it was, a, I had to pitch. You know, I had to really sell him on it. He did hire me before I presented any of the music. He and I had never done an orchestra score together. We thought about orchestra on T2, but we didn't have the time. And we decided that we liked what we were getting. On True Lies, ironically, going back one notch, I think what got me that job was striking distance. Oh, the orchestra sounded really good. I said, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> so then I realized, okay, he needed a solid thing. So it's kind of a, an unusual pleasure, I think, True Lies. Uh, it's sort of, you come back to it and think, oh, I forgot about this one. And it's got that slightly sort of um, buoyant silliness about it. Um, it's the kind of, it was that period where Schwarzenegger began to get lines, you know, and he, he kind of thought of himself as, a, you know, more of an actor. And you kind of have to kind of go with that. And he's all right in it. You know, he's fine, but it's that kind of weird problem with contractions again. And, you know, and, you know, it's got horses riding into elevators. It's got stuff blowing up. It's got Harrier jump jets, you know. He doesn't, you know, stint on any of the camera and stuff. You got to be totally sold on what you're doing. You can't be a step back, kind of going eh, 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 about it. Even though there's James Bondish things, it wasn't a spoof. It was his movie, True Lies, with that story, and he was having fun with it. Let's go. I married Rambo. 
the studios decided rather than getting these um, bodybuilders and martial artists, you know, like, you know, Seagal and Van Damme and, and trying to turn them into actors, why don't we hire actors and teach them how to do some of this action stuff and use doubles? They called me in at 20th Century Fox to talk about a movie called Speed. Why are they messing with me? Do they think I'm doing this for fun? <laughs> Speed script first went around. The, the sort of nickname for it was Die Hard on a Bus. And to which I said, fantastic. Once the bus goes 50 miles an hour, the bomb is armed. If it drops below 50, it blows up. And so it was an inspiration for Speed. That said, I had been playing with that idea for years, even, even before Die Hard came out. Um, and it was something that my father had told me about, that there was a script that Kurosawa had written about a train that couldn't slow down or blow up. That became Runaway Train. I saw that movie, uh, Konchalovsky's movie, it's pretty good, but I thought, hey, it'd be better if there was a bomb, uh, because in Runaway Train, they just can't get to the brakes uh, if it was a bomb and uh, if it was a bus. You know, we were trying to find a lead for speed. And then someone at the studio said, what about Keanu Reeves? And he was very young. We didn't know for sure. And then we met him and he's like 6'2". He was lean, he already had the cool haircut. He hadn't bulked up yet, but he was riding a motorcycle. And I was just like, oh, he's, he's cool. And he had done point break. So we knew he could run around with a, with a weapon and do stuff like that. And hopefully we could make it a little less uh, um, sort of over the top. I was speechless. Like, we, you're talking about the guy that was in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I am the Duke of Ted. Is gonna play a cop in this action movie. Yeah, is that the best we can do, can I, Reeves? Well, how wrong was I, okay? You know, in the first drafts of Speed, there was a whole thing I tried where you find out that his partner, who was eventually played by Jeff Daniels, is actually the one who's doing things, and it was this big twisty twist thing, and uh, it ultimately didn't work. And my the reason I'd done that is because I, I didn't think uh, having Jack uh, go up against someone who, I mean, they had no contact, really, except on the phone, if there was no personal thing, it wouldn't be that interesting, and I just neglected to think that if you cast Dennis Hopper, it's going to work great. I think I think Speed showed that you could have a cast that didn't have big stars in it, but that the the movie itself would be the star. I think when when Hollywood realized that they could cast somebody like Nicolas Cage in something like The Rock, I think when that happened around that that time, you know, the Jerry Bruckheimer type film, the, the Simpson Brookheimer movies, these movies forsook the action stars, the real action stars, the bodybuilders, the guys whose acting was a little rougher around the edges. Maybe we can do, you know, we can have Nick Cage in The, in the Rock, um, which is, you know, one of my favorite, I, I'm not always a huge fan of Michael Bay films, but that one I love. And it's got Nick Cage and Sean Connery, and it's like, this is pretty awesome. One thing you'll notice with a lot of those characters um, and those actors, they've got a sense of humor. And, and Nick Cage, my God, he was, he was a comic actor. He knew how to do that. So you get that guy in the lead, and I think you're probably rooting for him more than you are for um, someone who's huge. I was called in by Jake Bloom, who I had a three-picture deal with, told me, Matthias, you might as well give up. And I said, what do you mean? It's over. I said, what do you mean? It's over. It hasn't even started. Oh, no, I told the same to uh, Schwarzenegger, uh, Stallone. It's over. You guys are done. It's the Keanu Reeves. It's the Brad Pitts. It's the other guys now. It's not you anymore. It did seem like the very specific tropes of the kind of loosely cop or military-based action movie were starting to wear themselves out. These guys weren't able to sustain a career in theaters. Arnold's movies didn't make any more money. Stallone's movies didn't make any more money because they were too expensive to make. I remember seeing a test screening of I See You years before it came out. It had a disastrous test screening. Disaster! It was Stallone's big comeback after Copland. People cheered when he came on screen. By the time that movie was over, people were cursing in the lobby. Just a handful of years before, with stuff like Rambo 3, the biggest movie of all time at that that period, just a few years later, he was in this movie that was, you know, it was junk. 
Stallone and Van Damme started using stunt doubles a lot uh, once they moved into that straight to video era just because they didn't they didn't feel that what they were doing on screen was appreciated as much as it used to be when you'd see it in 35 millimeter on a big screen slow motion yeah that's Van Damme he's really doing that remember digital effects have a big that's a very important part of the story because what you saw was a transition from a time where the best that Hollywood could deliver in terms of spectacle was makeup and stunts and certain types of action to we can do anything. I remember when The Matrix came out and thinking to myself, okay, finally, Hollywood have figured out how to do it right. This is how you, you shoot a fight sequence. You do it the Hong Kong way. And here we're seeing it in The Matrix and it's glorious. But now we've found a way to, especially with all the comic book movies, to take an Oscar winning actor, a top actor in the game, and give him enough skills to look believable as an action star, whether that's putting a stuntman in a, in a superhero suit, or whether it's taking them for six months, three months, and putting them in a grueling training regimen to get them up to standard to be able to do stuff in camera like Keanu Reeves does, Charlize Theron. They've figured out how to make anyone look competent. Even Arnold, when he came back after Batman and Robin and Jingle All the Way, I mean, what the heck was he doing in those movies? His big comeback was End of Days. It was just such a grim time to be a real action star because all these actors were coming in and starring in action movies. And, you know, how far could the Schwarzenegger thing go without it becoming self-parody to a point where it was sort of self-damaging? Maybe we just got tired of, of that, you know, testosterone, massive, bulging chests period of, uh, that we celebrated for such a long time. I always say it's the death of the superstars. There aren't that many anymore because there's too many nothings. There's too many TV shows, too many nothings. How do you stand out? There's something about being on a big screen and your eyes are this big and people can see the soul of you. You know, you can't hide that from people. So you're either real or you're not. That's the problem with a lot of these uh, new guys. They can't stand up to that. I mean, the Bourne movies, you know, I think Doug Liman had a lot to do with the changes in action movies. I mean, his, that kind of, uh, that he was going to do handheld action. I remember him, he actually told me that, and I thought he was crazy. Um, but then I saw the movie, and I was like, okay, you were totally right, and I was wrong. This is what's sad. Bourne, which was echoing Bond, it was the new version of Bond, was so successful that Bond started emulating Bourne. That whole thing with the shaky cam which I hated with a passion. But that was a way of disguising the shortcomings of the performer and saying, okay, this is your new action star. You just can't see what they're doing. And Expendable was the first time, and done so cleverly, where it made sense to have like a Chuck Norris and an Arnold, and because their personalities come with it. I remember at that point, maybe I'd done three films with, no, four films with Jean-Claude and I was his henchman on Expendables 2. And, you know, we're there and there's Stallone and Schwarzenegger and Bruce Willis. And I remember looking at Van Damme and I could see that he was more nervous than me. <laughs> um, it was nice to see that from him, to be honest, a little bit of uh, vulnerability in that sort of, in that moment. Because it was a big deal for, for everyone to be on those films. Even Stallone and Arnold, you know. It was not lost on them, the fact that all these action stars had come together for one film. When the Expendables came out, and I was like, how come I'm not in there? I should be in there. You have all these guys in there. Are you kidding me? Why am I not in there? Because I was the top female then, in, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Executives are going to hire somebody for their popularity, and it's just going to be like, oh, come on. We're, we're, not, we're not buying that. There's a lot of movies with names that did not make it. So there's no more the star system that was 17 the 80s. I think that's done. Well, the big change has been you don't do the stunts for real anymore, and the CGI has changed them entirely. I think they can almost cut the stunts out because of the fact that special effects can do so much stuff 
They can make nothing look great. Yes, we can do anything now with the computer, but in the back of your mind, you know, you know when it's real and when it isn't. It, the Fast and Furious franchise is, is the most surprising franchise of all time. I mean, there's just no way you, anyone could have predicted. Every like last hope of classic 80s action movies to me is in the Fast and Furious because all of these things of the countdown and the thing and the missile's gonna go and the, you know, all that stuff, you don't see that in other films. It, it, like that pretty much is gone. I'm glad that we're getting the last gasp of the vitality that guys like Stallone and Schwarzenegger still have and possess a little bit. I mean, look at Arnold, if you're smart enough, he's 70 some years old and he's still involved in the Terminator series, you know? So you somehow have to find an angle how you fit into it. I would argue that Terminator is one of those, like the Matrix and like X-Men, the nature of the idea allows the universe to keep expanding. Uh, Bruce in these Die Hard sequels is getting more formidable. You know, Die Hard, what's tough about it is, it's a premise about a character who finds himself in an unlikely situation. If he keeps finding himself in that unlikely situation, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to keep that premise going. So, you know, the character is getting older, but he's getting more indestructible. I was at one point approached and I wrote a very extensive uh, treatment with my friend Chuck Mondry uh, of A Lethal Weapon 5. Never really kicked off, uh, but I like it. I, I still keep it, you know. Some people ask us, how would you do it? And I said, well, look at this, it's 63 pages of the treatment, read it, God damn it. If someone right comes along and tomorrow comes and knows how to do Aikido, it could be another Steven Seagal being born. It always has to be that guy that knows how to capture the audience. People are finally aware of who Scott Adkins is. Scott Adkins, for example, is a great martial artist, one of the best I've seen. And I think that's the allure about Scott, is that he can get up and do entirely all of his stunts and do some you know, incredible kicks and fight sequences, choreography, that make people watch the film and tell their friends about it. When I first started, um, you know, I'm talking about independent, lower budget sort of action movies. But when I first started, you, you had about seven weeks to make a film, which was, you know, difficult, but you could do it. And now that seven weeks has shrunk to about four weeks, sometimes three. And that for me is, is the most difficult part about being an action star as it is in today's world. Scott Atkins, myself, Tony John, we're, we're um, finding our way. Well, Scott and Tony are like my brothers. And I'm very connected to Scott. I'm just super proud every time I see him do stuff and I'm glad that he's, he's producing and, and getting involved, uh, you know, more in front and behind camera. He's kind of like my big brother, really. Someone I look up to and can ask advice. He's a very wise guy, he's been in the industry a long time, smart guy. Tony's such a beautiful spirit. He's probably the most um, person that's closest to the exemplary idea of what a martial artist is than anyone else I know. Uh, the things that I love about, you know, Jason Statham and Gerard Butler um, are, again, their charm, right? Because both of those guys can, you know, kick ass and, and do great stunts, um, but they also are funny. The Rock is incredible. I mean, he's a guy that uh, I think you would think that, you know, this guy so big and whatever, he can do whatever he wants to do, but he's like one of the nicest guys you will ever meet. Somebody should have had a word with The Rock about 10 years ago when he'd lost all of his muscle, because he was obviously thinking, Maybe this muscle thing's not good anymore. Maybe I'm too big to make it in Hollywood. Well, he's changed his tune now, hasn't he? When he did uh, Pain and Gain, he, whoa, he, he went big again. And he stayed that way ever since. I want Dwayne Johnson to just make his R-rated movie. I want to see him make his Commando, his Rambo. He doesn't have a Touchstone movie. I mean, present day, there's the Deadpools, which cost a lot of money. They don't cost probably as much as an Avengers does, uh, but they cost a lot to make, and they are as R as you can get. I like The Raid, I like The Raid 2. Again, these movies are not, um, they're not for everybody though. 
raid movies are borderline horror films. I mean, they're so bloody and, and just taxing on your spirit after a while. Like Commando, you can watch with your, your dad, your grandfather, your son, and your wife or your girlfriend. You can't watch the raid with those people. You gotta, you, you gotta watch the raid by yourself or with your, like, your buddy. I think you are seeing a return to R-rated uh, action movies. I think, obviously, Taken um, was one of them, but John Wick, I mean, John Wick is, I would argue, kind of a better version of an 80s action movie in that you could pitch the first 30 minutes of John Wick and grab somebody's attention. And the action is so different than the action in other movies. I look at Keanu Reeves and what it does in the John Wick films and The Matrix and other movies, action films. And because I'm someone that does it, I understand how hard it is. And I can see the hard work that he puts into it. If Keanu Reeves can pull off John Wick, other people can pull this off too. But why can Keanu Reeves pull it off? It's not that Keanu Reeves even has a muscle, but Keanu Reeves is so super cool. The true action stars of today are somebody like Keanu Reeves and Tom Cruise, and they're, you know, he's literally putting his life on the line, Cruise. I mean, you've got to respect that. He might not be as physically capable as Jet Li or, or Van Damme, but man, he's hanging off the, the side of planes, right? It's amazing. A couple of the big action directors nowadays started out being stunt doubles. Chad Stahelski, who's directed the, um, the John Wick movies, he was a stunt double for Keanu Reeves. Also, David Leach was Brad Pitt's stunt double for years, and he was also the stunt double for Van Damme. They're both directing huge movies now. David did those, um, the Deadpool sequel, and they, they basically know how this shit works. It's not clear to me what the kids think about this, what a teenager now thinks about Stallone and the Rockies and the Rambos and Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator that's about to come out, the new one. For you and I, we remember the glory days of action cinema. It's full on, pulls no punches, gory, violent. Miss those movies, man. It's because I fell in love with these guys in their first, the first time we saw them, Above the Law. You know, wow, he came out of nowhere, Steven Seagal. What a, what a beautiful talent he had. And he was different than anybody else. And even though over time, their skills or, or their appearance may have degraded a bit. You know, I mean, we look at Steven Seagal today, he's not the same guy we remember, but he still has that skill. And it's still worth watching. It is. The action movies of the 80s, the ones that are memorable, they had a little more plotting, uh, more twists, more plausible villains. And nowadays, I think people are emulating just, just the stunts you know, and not looking at the underlying material. Well, you know, I think the films of the 80s, I, I think they came from old school heads who they knew story arc, they knew character arc. And built on that, they put action there that was organically motivated by the story. I find more today that the action motivates the story, not the story motivates the action. The question is, uh, do you care about anybody that got shot? That's the real question. <laughs> but today, I don't, you know, you got shot. I, li I like that special effect, that was great. But do I care about you? Today's uh, generation just seems like, they don't care what's out there. I'm gonna go see it. We're still hopefully grasping to that, that feeling we had when we watched those movies for the first time as kids. I can't compare anybody nowadays to Stallone and Schwarzenegger. These guys aren't meatheads, even though people, you know, the people seemingly want to, you know, the sophisticados want to like kind of downgrade someone. No, these are the smartest dudes in the room and they'll whoop your ass. They're fun. That's why they're cool. That's why they'll always be around. That's why those guys will be in wheelchairs and still doing it. <laughs>
you know, dark man, which I love. I mean, what would you have called that when that came out? Obviously, it's a superhero movie, but what were they calling it at the time? Was it, was it an action film? Was it, you know, it was an action film, right? A weird one. Yeah, the R-rated superhero movies. I always thought that Spawn should have been an R-rated movie. It was, it wasn't R. It was um, PG. But I always felt that Spawn should be very much like the comic book, very dark. And uh, you know, in Blade, I think, I think it really hit right where it should have. I, I think there, there should be a return to more of that. We're doing this big action movie. And it's written for Dolph. Now, can you believe it? Dolph doesn't want it. He wants to play the cop. What an idiot. Who wants to be the cop? He, it was made for him to be the Terminator. That's, no one can play it like Dolph. He's a, but he doesn't want it. His own fault. But guess what? This is your break. You're going to take his movie and you're going to be the, the guy in his role and you're going to be the Terminator. You're going to kill all these people. But you have to do all your own stunts. Arnold Schwarzenegger was the buffest guy on the set, right? That you saw. But there was a guy called Sven, which was his trainer. Did you know about that? Sven Ali Coulson. Yes. Do you know to show off how weak he thought Arnold was? He would say, Arnold, come here. Put your elbows up. This is a true story. He put his hands under Arnold's elbows and lift him in the air like this. <laughs> Bloodsport? Uh, and the kickboxer movie after it, uh, the first two Jean-Claude Van Damme films. I didn't actually write those songs, they were, but they hired me to sing, to sing them. So, um, but I was, uh, I was approached as a, basically as a session session singer. That's, I did a lot of that back in the 80s. I was the voice for Toyota trucks and Coors beer and all these kinds of things. But, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I went to the screening and uh, I met Jean-Claude Van Damme and. Uh, Nice guy, you know, he was he was cool. He came out later to a, a nightclub I was playing at, and uh, the the bouncers were giving him a hard time. He had like an entourage with him, and I said, "Oh, let this guy in." So he comes over to thank me later, and I told him that I was the one who sang <laughs> in the the first movie, and he said, "Oh, the the music was better than the movie." <laughs> We had to have a certain kind of a body, or at least on the road to that kind of body, or we weren't action heroes. And that was because of Sly Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger. They set the standard with steroids, mind you, but they set the standard. And uh, in fact, I won't say who said this, but uh, I will give you an imitation. It's my favorite line I've ever heard him say, and I've heard him say many funny things. If I had known about human growth hormone, I'd have never done steroids. I will not say who that is. I know what you're setting up. The poster's on the wall. Speed two. I know. But as, as I always point out to people, um, it says based on characters created by, it was a party that uh, I was not invited to. And uh, there was part of it was like, well, well, I should be writing this. But you know, the way Hollywood works, Jan DeBont became the star and he got to sort of do what he wanted. and. That didn't really include me on the sequel, and I was fine. You know, I I can pick apart that sequel, um, everything that's wrong with it. I hate RoboCop 2, although I, I got to tell you this, when they were making RoboCop 2, they called me up and they said, Ronnie, we're going to do RoboCop 2. I said, so? And, and they said, uh, would you be interested in being in it? I said. Did you not see RoboCop 1? I, I went out of a 140 story window and I'm dead. They said, no, 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 you don't get it. What, we fixed up RoboCop. What if we fixed up Dick Jones and he was Robo villain? I, I went somewhere, I think I was on IMDB trying to check because someone told me there was an incorrect credit and I was trying to go and see if I had to fix it. And there was a chat room on there and someone said, what happened to Brad Fidel? And someone else, I heard that, I'm like, Somebody cares? I mean, I'm just, I've always just been in the trenches doing my thing till I wasn't anymore and moved on to other things. And so it's, it's heartening to think that all those years and hours spent in the studio that there's actually, it's inspiring or meaningful to somebody somewhere. As I look back, you know, I, I love all the movies, you know, well, most of them, I can't say all of them that I did, but, but I like the fact that where my career went and would I love to be in an A movie? Yes, and I still think there is hope that I, I will be in one someday.
So Last Action Hero is a bittersweet experience for me because it, on the one hand there were some great moments and I had a chance to work with John McTiernan who was one of my idols. I just didn't think the film came out very well. It did not change my enthusiasm. It did not alter my approach as I went on because eh, at that point I was perfectly willing to write one off as a job for hire where uh, it's not my job in that case to complain to the director. It's my job in that case to sort of do the best I can and execute the vision that I'm being paid to, to service. And I, I really like Predator 2. You know, um, it's not as good as Predator, but it, it kind of makes the point of not having Arnold in it work well. And it makes the old, I love the idea of a Predator and these kind of big drug gangs, because it's kind of a nice urban vibe. I'm not like you liked a Predator movie since then, but I like them too as a pair. I think that they kind of work really well. Uh, I've heard that Arnold is talking about maybe doing Commando 2 again, but you know that's you know you know it, it was supposed to be ten, you, know, you know a few years later. Um, I think that the uh, IP. I, I know what you're saying. I don't know if everything I've done loans itself to uh, 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 perpetuation. Uh, Judge Dredd came back again, and they did it right. Uh, but still, nobody went. It's just not that well known uh, here in the states. Yes, Richard Dunn, yeah, absolutely. It was so much fun, greatest guy. When I actually, they'd pushed us to, I was on the film for a long time and they, they'd switched the schedule and I knew I was pregnant from the very beginning, but I was like, okay, but I'm gonna be shot out. Oh, and that, bath, that bathing suit scene is, and then they switched the schedule and it was, I knew I was gonna be like five or six months pregnant and I was like, oh no. So I told the wardrobe woman, I said, can you tell him? And, and his first question was, does she know who the father is? <laughs> She's like, yes, of course she knows who the father is. She's just worried about the scheduling and, you know, is she going to show too much? Now, Terminator 3 was okay, not great. I'm the first one to admit it. Because very hard with, the, with also going back to the future, coming to the present, it's very hard to keep expanding and making a story. And then, you know, and then people start like doing more effects and more effects. It becomes too much. But this one, there's at least Cameron involved, and he's supervising it, so I'm sure it'll, it'll be kind of... Because number four was okay, not, not really fantastic. We were gonna do uh, the, the number four, but we had a totally different approach to it. Fury Road, I think, is the only movie I've seen multiple times in a theater uh, in the last 10 years, other than something that my kids made me go see. Um, to me, that was one of the best action movies I've ever seen. I mean, the trailer for Fury Road is one of the best action movies I've ever seen. Like, I could watch that trailer over and over again for like an hour and still consider that a pretty good action movie. People come up to me and, and say, you know, I grew up on, on Road Warrior, Commando, Inner Space, man, that, that, that was my childhood. And it, it cre you know, it, it, it um, created who I am and I always when I say that I always sort of step back half a step you know probably another serial killer um, because you know anybody that watches those movies that much man is warped somewhere but people you know I would have when I'm doing a comic con I will have fathers bring their, their children over to meet me because he grew up his father showed him Road Warrior or Commando uh, when he was like 12 or 30, they snuck him into the, the when mum was in bed, you know, and they sat there and they watched it together. And he's, since then, he's been addicted to it. And, um, and so he's kids, he wants them to meet the guy that did it, you know, this is the guy that was in it. So it, it's quite interesting that um, now I think they're more relevant than they were when we made them. Well, again, like I said, Die Hard, I think, was great. It was a great film. I think Lethal Weapon was a very decent film, you know, so, and, uh, but I think these, it's the one and one, but, but the, you know, part two, part three, you know, I, I think those started dropping down a little bit because the quality of the, the, whoever wrote the film just could not match what was originally done. Uh, I have stepped into a lot of my favorite franchises somehow and, and taken the baton from another composer. Rambo is a great example. One of my heroes, Jerry Goldsmith, you know, scored some of the greatest action scores of, of certainly in the 80s of all time, really. Um, so when he started with First Blood and all the way through Three, uh, it's funny, when Stallone called me for that, uh, for one thing, when Sly called me 
to do Rambo, I didn't think it was Sly on the phone. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll get past that. I thought it was a friend uh, pranking me. And so I, 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 I was busy too and I kind of hung up. <laughs> it's really bad. Uh, um, anyway, so once I found it was actually Sylvester Stallone on the phone, I went and met, him, met with him and, and the first thing he said was like, look, uh, I, I love your music, but what do you think we should do here? You know, there's a big void, Jerry, you know? And do we just kind of reset? And I was like, no, we, we don't reset. What we do is we, we use Jerry's themes, pay homage, it's the heart of Rambo, but we need surrounding themes that are new, that complement it. And the main theme that I wrote for Rambo, it's funny, uh, I've heard a lot of people miss attribute it to Jerry because it, they, I always play I play them in next to each other always. you hear the trumpet you hear the Jerry Goldsmith theme and then my theme comes and it's kind of like the B section and sometimes it's reversed and Jerry's the B section on this so it's so intertwined and I kind of wrote it in the style of Jerry to me that's the way to do it I want to say thank you in supporting The Last Action Heroes. Uh, it's been wonderful. Thank you for the book, by the way, and thank you for the series. I'm a fan of all, of all of it. I'm a fan of the genre, and I'm a fan of all my colleagues. I'm a true fan.